God wants us to do and refrain from doing what God does not want us to do. And Uzziah, the king, was a leper until the day of his death and dwelt in a separate, several segregated, separated house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. We'll come to point number two. We'll see the result, the consequence, the judgment of God upon pride. In the case of Nebuchadnezzar, we're coming back to Daniel now. Daniel chapter 4. In Daniel chapter 4, we want to see the strange punishment, the extraordinary punishment confirmed by the Almighty God Himself. In Daniel chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 31. Daniel chapter 4, verse 31. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be for the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee until thou know the most high rulers in the kingdom in the kingdom of men, and giveth thee to whomsoever he will. And then in verse 33, and the same hour was the same fulfilled upon the Cadnezer, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet of the dew of heaven, till his ears were grown like the eagle's feathers, and his nails like the bird's claws. That's the judgment that came in chapter 5. We have this, uh, chapter 5 of, of uh, Daniel, reading from verse 4. Daniel, chapter 5, verse 4. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver and of brass and of iron and of wood and of stone. In the same hour came forth the fingers of a man's hand. This is the son, Belshazzar. And see the judgment that came here upon the sun. There was no delay for 12 hours, 12 days, 12 months. No, immediately. It was sinning at this time. And the one he didn't have to come. After all, the Lord had made an example of his father, Nebuchadnezzar. And the Lord had said, Nebuchadnezzar, because of that pride, until you know that the God of heaven reigns in the affairs of the kingdoms of men, you will be driven away from the uh, from the society of men, and you will eat grass like the beast of the field. And then the Lord waited 12, 12, 12 months before the judgment came. In the case of Belshazzar, it came immediately in the same hour. Came forth fingers of human's hand and wrote over it, gazed the candlestick upon the place of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loose, and his knees moved one against another. You see how the judgment came. God still brings judgment today. From the royal residence, Nebuchadnezzar could see the splendor of the capital of his empire. The, the sight filled him with the glorious boasting. And the judgment of heaven fell upon him. It was the verbal expression of pride, the greatest of Nebuchadnezzar's sins, that judgment fell upon him at this time. When you think about this, and you make a comparison, between what Nebuchadnezzar had done before, what Nebuchadnezzar had said before, this one that he said now is not this Babylon, great Babylon, that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. Yes, we know it's sinful to say that. 
We know his pride that made him to say that. We know it's the haughtiness in the heart of the man that made him to say that. But the question is, was that the greatest sin that this man, the Kadnezer, had committed? No. He had committed some other sins before. What had he done before? Number one, he had made an image, an idol of gold. That's even more serious. To make an image of gold? That's more serious than just saying, look at Babylon, I built it for the greatness of my might, by my, for my majesty. Not only that, number two, he had compelled people and nations to worship his idol. Isn't that very serious? To make thousands of people, who knows, millions of people, to command them and compel them to worship idol. That was a great sin. And yet, this kind of judgment did not fall at that time. You know what the Lord is telling us? A person may commit his sin now, and then nothing happens. Then he commits another sin, and nothing happens. And he commits another sin, and nothing happens. And then after that, he does a little thing. A so-called minor sin. A so-called sin that you should have overlooked. But then God says, this is the time for the judgment to come. Even though what he has done now appears little in comparison with what he had done before. Because now, this last draw made the cup of iniquity to be full. You know that in the past, he has despised and blasphemed God. He said, if you don't worship my idol, and I decide to throw you into the furnace of fire, who is that God that will deliver you out of my hand? God didn't punish him at that time. His cup was still being full. You know what I'm telling you? There are people that commit sin. And they commit sin little by little by little. They commit sin stage after stage, one level after another level. And then the judgment will have been announcing the wrath of God will have been talking about did not fall upon them. And they say, you see now, all this says, they say judgment is coming. Flee and escape from the wrath to come. Nothing is happening. Who will say that that thing I did the other time is not sinful? I did it and nothing happened. Just wait. It's coming. And then the Padmissa again were told that he threw the faithful people of God, servants of God, into the furnace of fire. I think that's even more serious. More serious than just saying, it's not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of my kingdom, of the kingdom, by the might of my power. I built it for the honor of my majesty. I think throwing three people into the furnace of fire and killing them off like that, which you wanted to do, I would have thought this one is more serious. Yes, it's more serious, but his cup was getting full. It was, it was going stage by stage and level after level. Eventually, he even consulted magicians and soothsayers, and then now the final draw that made the cup of iniquity to be filled up. Uh, you know, there's a language like that in the Bible that God says, I'm still waiting. Yes, they are sinful, but I'm still waiting. Yes, they have done wrong, but I'm still watching. And then eventually they do something, and the cup of iniquity now is full. We're looking at Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. We're looking at verse 16. Genesis 15, 16. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. God said, I'm going to judge the Amorites. They're very sinful people, wicked people. They're notorious for immorality and iniquity. But the judgment is coming. It's not now. Why is it not now? Because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're reading from verse 16. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. To fill up their sins always. For the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. The Lord here is saying, these Jewish people, they killed the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And now Jesus rose from the dead. And the disciples are going about and preaching the gospel. And then these people, same people that killed the Lord Jesus Christ, they said, we killed him, his only begotten son was still alive. All those parables he told that the king sent his son to come and get the fruit out of the vineyard. And now they killed the son. What do you think he will do to those wicked people? He will miserably destroy them. But we killed the only begotten Son of God, and he has not done anything. But they continued now, and it says, They are forbidding us and hindering us from preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, that they might be saved. And it is to fill up, to make full the cup of iniquity. Until the wrath of God, until the judgment of God will come upon them to the uttermost. Matthew chapter 23. In Matthew chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 32 and verse 33. Matthew chapter 23, Jesus used the same language concerning the Pharisees, filling up the cup of the iniquity. And when it's full, the judgment will come. Matthew 23, verse 32. Fill ye up the measure of your fathers. Fill it up. The things you do. Even though you have been sinning and the Lord has been sparing you. Just watching. Not willing that anybody should perish. But at all shall come to repentance. It says, you fill it up. And then ye serpents and ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape? Once the cup of iniquity is full, how can he escape the damnation of hell? Remember in Nineveh had 40 days of respite, and he repented, so the judgment did not come. At the end, at the first announcement of judgment against Ahab, he was alarmed, and he had a momentary repentance, Yet, he did not say that repentance. The Lord said, because he repented, I will not bring the judgment. Eventually, he went back into his evil. Because Jezebel, his wife, instigated him, influenced him, almost compelled him to remain, to continue in evil. Eventually, the judgment came. We're looking at Obadiah verses 3 and 4. Obadiah. Verses 3 and 4. Judgment comes eventually after God has manifested patience, long suffering, mercy, delaying the judgment. The pride continues. Judgment eventually comes. Obadiah verse 3. The pride of thine heart has deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the cleanse of the rock. Whose habitation is high, that says in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? You see that pride? Who shall bring me down? I am, and nobody else. I do, and nobody can hinder. I say what I want, and nobody can contradict it. I live the way I want, and nobody can check me or put me under control. That pride will bring the man down. Look at verse 4. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, though thou set thy nest upon the stars, then will I bring thee down, says the Lord. I pray God will help us. Have mercy on us and turn away from pride, arrogance, haughtiness, evil of every form, every shape, so that the judgment of God will not come upon us in Jesus' name. In Job chapter 24, verse 24. Job chapter 24, verse 24. They are exalted for a little while, but are gone and brought low. You see that? They are exalted for a little while. And God will not allow anyone to continue indefinitely in any sin, and especially in the sin of pride, they exalted for a little while, but are gone and brought low. They are taken out of the way as all other, and cut off as the tongues of the ears of corn. And if it be not so now, who will make me a liar 
I make my speech nothing worth. Job chapter 26. Job chapter 26, verses 11 and 12. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. He divided the sea with his power, and by his understanding, he smites through the proud. He knows when to get the proud, and he knows when to smite the proud. He knows when to judge the proud. He knows when to bring down the proud. He knows when to crush the proud. And you know, sometimes if you don't understand that somebody has been committing some secret sin in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord had never done anything about it, and the Lord does sin, repent. Turn. Why will you die, O house of Israel? Why will you die, O backslider? But everybody has been saying, brother, sister, brother, sister. And the fellow has been living in sin, and just, you know, having, having his own day, his own way. And one day, he now does something, and what he does appears minute, appears small, appears negligible, appears like nothing. He just, we say he just made a mistake and he said something he shouldn't have said. He just came up with and just said, It's not this Babylon that I have built for the glory of my, the majesty of my name and by my power and my skill. And then God brings judgment. A finality comes. And then we say, How can God do this? Look at what that man has done. It's not that serious. Why don't we just warn him? We don't know. We don't understand. Do you know what he has been doing in secret? And do you know how he has been filling that cup and filling that cup and filling that cup until the cup of iniquity becomes full and then that proud word, arrogant word, boasting word then comes out of the mouth and God says, that is enough. And because you do not know the history of the man, you do not know what he has been doing in the secret, which God knows. And when God brings judgment over that seemingly insignificant thing, then we say, how can it be like this? But God is wise. God knows what he's doing. And I pray that those of us who are learning the word of God will take notes and will not go on in any sin in pride in Jesus' name. Isaiah chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 11. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 11. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the fortunes of men shall be bowed down. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the Lord, for the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty. And upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. It says, everyone, everyone, everyone that is lifted up, begin to ask yourself, are you proud? And what are you proud about? What makes you proud? Your knowledge? The skill? Your position? Your privilege? Your ability to do something others cannot do? That makes you proud in your heart. It starts in the heart. And then after that, it's expressed with the mouth. And then it's revealed in action. And then sometimes when you do it, I see it. Here I am. I'll do what I'll do. Who can hold me as a God in heaven? Nobody could judge the goodness on earth. No high court, no supreme court could judge the goodness at his own time. But the word came from heaven to you, it is said, O king, the Padnezer, the kingdom is departed from thee. I pray we'll escape that judgment. In verse 17, and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the fortunes of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted. In that day, Isaiah chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 9, Isaiah 23, verse 9. The Lord of hosts has purposed it to stain the pride of all glory, 
the Lord God of heaven, the one that judged Pharaoh, judged Nebuchadnezzar, judged Herod, that same God has purposed it to steal the pride of all glory and to bring it to content all the honorable of the earth. But told in Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 12, let's see how God brought the judgment immediately, swiftly, without a moment's warning. And let us see how God still judges today. Because he says, I am God, I change not. God doesn't change. He doesn't say, now nah, I'm adjusting. And I've just said to you, I've just said to you, the attitude of people, the actions of people, the haughtiness of men and women, and the pride of men and women, I'm adjusting. And since they will not change, I have to change never, never. When he's threatening the blood upon the, upon the people at the time of Noah, for 120 years they did not change. But God did not change because of that. The judgment still came. And the same thing God says, I'm God, I change not. His standards change not. His pronouncements change not. His judgments change not. His decisions change not. And wherever there is pride, those that walk in pride, he is able, not only able, he is determined that you will abase them. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 20. Acts, chapter 12, verse 20. And Herod was highly displeased of them, of Tyre and Sidon, 